Hello, and welcome back to the Wolf's Den. We are the Order of the Green Hand, here to bring some clarity to A Song of Ice and Fire. In our last video, we discussed what life was like in Westeros after the Andals seized control of the six southern kingdoms, and how they used their reinvented religion to exercise control over Westeros from their pseudo-capital they stole from the High Towers. We also discussed how, at first, the Faith welcomed Aegon the Conqueror with open arms, and how gracious the High Septon was when he offered his barren niece as a bride for Aegon's son, Magor, and how years later, because of their immense support during the early days of Aenys' reign, he enjoyed a peaceful and prosperous transition into power that carried straight through his short reign, until he suddenly began getting tummy aches that somehow managed to age him like 25 years in a matter of weeks, without rousing any suspicion whatsoever. Until, one day, he collapsed and died. The Faith was being really friendly at the time, so Visenya went to go bring her extremely charming son, Magor, back to Westeros, because she thought Magor needed some new friends, and the Faith militant seemed like his kind of guys. Coming up, we are going to be picking up right where we left off, with Magor and his new BFF's Trial of Seven, and bringing you through his reign as king. And, more importantly, how without Magor, House Targaryen would have been nothing more than a very distant, insignificant memory. So, let's do this. As mentioned in our last video, upon returning to King's Landing, Visenya appealed to the crowd that any man who wished to challenge her son's right to the throne to come forth and do so with their body. The warrior sons were quick to accept her challenge. The Grand Captain of the warrior sons, Sir Damon Morgan, declared that only a trial of seven could settle the matter. As many of you who are familiar with our videos know, George takes great care when choosing the name of a character, and Morgan is a name that really catches your attention when you see it. The Morgan is a figure from Irish mythology who was considered to be the goddess of war, fate, death, battle, birth, rivers, lakes, and fresh water, was known to be vengeful, and is associated with night and darkness. She is also a shapeshifter, and is believed to possess the ability to foretell doom and death in battle, where she often takes the form of a crow. In many of the stories, the Morrigan appears as a trio of goddesses, in some taking the image of the mother maiden in crone, and in others taking the form of three sisters, Morgan, Bob, and Neiman. In her triple form, she is referred to as the Three Morigna. Ancient Celts believed that the Morgan was so powerful that she could bring back the dead and revive fallen soldiers so they could rejoin the battle. House Morrigan has a crow on their banner and named their keep the Crow's Nest, so it would seem that the man the Faith chose to lead their army came from a house that was inspired by a vengeful Celtic goddess of darkness and death that possessed the power to raise the dead to fight as her minions. That sounds a little bit familiar, doesn't it? The names and or sigils of the other six champions who stood with Daemon are as dark and dangerous as the Grand Captain himself, but in the interest of time we will only be discussing one of them in great detail here. Everything else that we found on Aegon Ambrose, Lyle Bracken, Garibald of the Seven Stars, the Septon Knight, William the Wanderer, and Dickon Flowers, the Bastard of Beesbury, will be available in a PDF file on our Patreon. Okay, so Harris Horp, also known as Death's Head Harry, hails from House Horp, whose coat of arms has three Death's Head moths. Well, in our world, there happen to be three known species of Death's Head moths, earning their name from the skull-like shape that appears on their thorax. 
All three types are from the genus Acherontia, which derives its name from the Acheron, also known as the River of Pain, which is a river in the underworld and believed by some to be a tributary of the Styx River. The Styx River is said to divide the world of the living from the world of the dead and encircle the underworld seven times. It is governed by a Greek underworld goddess named Styx, also known as the Master of Shadows, whose name was later used as a species of death's head moths, the Acherontia Styx. Another species of the death's head moth is the Acherontia atropos, which you may recognize from the promotional marquee posters for the Silence of the Lambs. Atropos was a Greek goddess who had the power to choose the manner in which all mortals would die. Her Roman equivalent is Morta, whose name derives from a Latin word meaning death. Atropos even lent her name to the scientific classification of deadly nightshade, Atropa belladonna. The third species of death's head moths is the Acherontia lachesis which derives its name from another Greek goddess. Lachesis was one of the three fates, along with Atropos, and was in charge of deciding how much life was to be allowed each person, and in assigning them their destiny, earning her another title as the Disposer of Lots. Lachesis also lent her name to the genus classification for several species of venomous pit vipers found throughout Central and South America. These sit-and-wait predators are masters of camouflage, which, together, allows them to deceive and ambush their prey, unleashing a venom so lethal that even when an anti-venin is administered, survival stands at less than 20%. So, this should give you an idea as to what kinds of guys the warrior sons had fighting for them. And if you're interested to know what we found on the other guys, check us out on Patreon. Against them stood Magar Targaryen and his six champions. The first to answer the call was a simple man-at-arms by the name of Dick Bean, proclaiming that he was born a king's man and means to die a king's man. The first knight to step forward was Bernard Brune, hailing from House Brune of Dire Den, out on Crackclaw Point. And as nimble Dick Crabb told Brienne, we're all good dragon men up Crackclaw Way. Bernard then appealed to the crowd, asking, are there no true knights here? No leal men? The names of the other four men chosen by Magar are writ large in the history of Westeros. Sir Bram of Black Hall, a hedge knight shamed by the example set by Dick Bean and the appeal of Bernard Brune. Also, Sir Rayford Rosby, Sir Guy Lawston, also known as Guy the Glutton because of his immense size, and Sir Lucifer Massey, the Lord of Stone Dance, hailing from an ancient First Men family that were dragon men from the very start. Accounts of the trial by Seven differ greatly. But no one can deny that Magor was the only man still breathing when all was said and done. At first, many thought Magor was dead as well, after receiving a terrible blow to the head. But when his mother removed his broken helm, she yelled out, The king breathes, the king lives, and the victory was his. Now, we cannot stress enough how important it was that Magor survived this trial of seven, as King Aene's heir, Aegon, was still a boy, and from what little we know of him, did not seem to possess the mental fortitude that was going to be needed to take the actions to ensure the Targaryens remained on the throne. This was going to require a leader who was steadfast and resolute in his decisions, strong-willed, determined, and at times, utterly merciless. In other words, if Maester Aemon was there, he would have turned to Magor and told him what he told John: It must be you, or no one. For 27 days, Magor was under the care of the Maesters. And for 27 days, Magor lingered on the brink of death, 
while 700 warrior sons remained encamped on Rainy's Hill, and thousands of poor fellows marched on King's Landing. On the 28th day, a ship arrived from Pentos, carrying Queen Alice of House Haraway, a pale raven-haired woman named Tyanna of the Tower, and 600 sellswords. Upon their arrival, Visenya quickly dismissed the maesters and placed Magor in Tyanna's care. Magor woke the next morning. That's not suspicious or anything. It was said that when Magor appeared on the walls of the Red Keep, standing between Alice Haraway and Tyanna of Pentos, the crowds cheered wildly, and the city erupted in celebration. Magor's next order of business was to put an end to the fanatics encamped on Rainey's Hill. So he mounted Balerion, flew over to the Sept of Remembrance, and unleashed the absolute fury of the Black Dread, killing every single warrior's son in King's Landing. Maybe this is where Cersei drew her inspiration for her tell-all bestseller, Separating Church and State, a How-To Guide. The overly dramatic scholars, otherwise known as maesters, allege that a quote-unquote pall hung over King's Landing for an unbelievably convenient seven days after Magor brought fire and blood to the cream of their crop. But I'm pretty sure they just call that cloudy stuff smoke. His war with the Faith had only just begun, however, and would continue throughout the remainder of his reign. His first act upon reassuming the Iron Throne was to command the poor fellows marching on King's Landing to lay down their weapons or die. They didn't listen. So he called on all leal lords to disperse the Faith's ragged hordes by force. Not to be outdone, the High Septon commanded all true and pious children of the gods to rise up and put an end to the reign of dragons, monsters, and abominations. The first battle happened at Stonebridge, where nine thousand poor fellows under the command of a gigantic axeman named Watha Hewer met six unnamed lord's hosts, which is actually a common theme throughout Magor's reign. His enemies are intricately chronicled, but his allies are almost never mentioned. Anyways, Watha Hewer and his ragged band of rebels were absolutely no match for Magor's loyalists, and the slaughter was such that the Mander ran red for about 70 miles, and the place where the battle was fought has been called Bitterbridge ever since. Next, at the fork of the Blackwater Rush, Magor met 20,000 warriors of the Faith, 13,000 of which were poor fellows, and the rest included a few hundred warrior sons, as well as the hosts of several pious lords from the Westerlands and Riverlands. Magor's army was of about equal size, but he also had Balerion the Black Dread. Now, the rain that engulfed the battle probably dampened his fires a little, but it didn't stop him from continuously raining fire on his enemies, and by the time the day ended, Magor and his allies had once again emerged victoriously. Having dealt with both of the Faith's armies, Magor turned his attention to an issue that had troubled him for years, his lack of an heir which he apparently thought could only be remedied by taking a third wife, Tyanna of the Tower. Grand Maester Miles protested and told him that his one true wife was waiting for him in the High Tower. Magor heard him out in silence, then killed him where he stood. He married Tyanna atop the Hill of Rainies, amidst the ashes and bones of the warrior's sons he killed there and made a limbless Watt the Hewer watch. The High Septon denounced the quote-unquote abomination and his whores, and Cerise Hightower continued insisting that she was the rightful queen. But Magor would have paid more heed to a mouse squeaking in the corner. By the time 43 AC rolled around, Magor had taken personal charge of the construction of the Red Keep, and it would seem that additional security was high on his priority list, as he ordered that a castle within a castle be built, as well as a maze of secret passages and tunnels. Meanwhile, 
the warrior's son's chosen new leader, a knight by the name of Sir Joffrey Doggett, who was determined to bring the order back to its former glory. While thousands of poor fellows haunted the roads, falling upon travelers and swarming over towns, villages, and poorly defended castles, killing Targaryen loyalists wherever they found them. In other words, they became brigands. One thing we noticed is that the holy soldiers of the Seven seem to use the woods as a gathering place and hideout. It is said that one group of poor fellows, led by a woman named Poxy Jane Poor, made traveling through the Kingswood impossible for honest travelers. And a guy named Septon Moon and his rabble would travel through the forests and appear without warning all over the place. This reminded us of the outlaw bandits who styled themselves the Kingswood Brotherhood, that were famously dealt with by Sir Arthur Dane during the reign of Eris II. Which makes you wonder if they were the remnants of Poxy Jane's rabble, or if the Faith was beginning to flex their muscles at the Targaryens again. None of this went unnoticed. Magor sent ravens to every corner of Sevendom, commanding lords and knights of questionable loyalty to present themselves at court and pay homage, and also present the king with a hostage to ensure future cooperation. Some listened, but some didn't. Magor let this charade go on for about a half a year, before unleashing his mother on the reach. Visenya reduced five Andal lords' keeps to ashes in a single night. Then, Magor joined the party, unleashing Beleriand on the Westerlands. Once he was satisfied, he joined his mother and headed south towards Old Town, intent on bringing fire and blood to this high septon and his minions. Lord Martin Hightower called his banners as if that was going to help, and not wanting to lose the battle of feudal gestures, 200 warrior sons surrounded the starry sept. Those still in the city that night went to sleep full well knowing that the dragons would be there in the morning, when absolutely out of nowhere, the perfectly healthy High Septon mysteriously died, giving Lord Martin Hightower enough time to open his gates, arrest all of the warrior sons in his city, and raise Targaryen banners over his walls before Magor and Visenya arrived. But who killed him? Maester Yandel pointed the finger at Lord Hightower's brother, who was one of the 200 warrior sons guarding the Starry Sept that night, but a cleverly worded paragraph in The Sons of the Dragon seems to point a citadel-sized finger at the truth of the matter. Many and more remain certain he was murdered, but by whom? Sir Morgan Hightower did the deed at the command of his lord brother, some say, and Sir Morgan was seen entering and leaving the High Septon's privy chambers that night. Others point to Lady Patrice Hightower, Lord Martin's maiden aunt, and a reputed witch who did indeed seek an audience with his High Holiness at dusk, though he was alive when she departed. The Archmaesters of the Citadel are also suspected, though whether they made use of the Dark Arts, an assassin, or a poisoned scroll is still a matter of some debate. Messages went back and forth between the Citadel and the Starry Sept all night. So, in that passage, we are given three possible suspects for the High Septon's murder, with a little extra information in parentheses after each of them. Sir Morgan Hightower was an officer of the Warrior's Sons, who met with the High Septon that night. But the issue here is that knights don't tend to be poisoners. The next suspect is Lord Hightower's aunt, who is somehow still a maiden and met with the High Septon on the evening he died as well. But all accounts agree he was fine after she departed. Yandel seems to think that she was added to the suspect list simply on the grounds that poison tends to be a woman's weapon. Then they drop the bomb that suspect number three are none other than the godly Archmaesters, who they surmise could have made use of the Dark Arts, an assassin, or a poisoned scroll. The last of which seems the most plausible when considering the extra information provided, 
which is that scrolls had been going back and forth between the Citadel and the High Septon all night. If true, then we can only conclude that the Archmaesters possess the knowledge and skills necessary to kill a full-grown man by poisoning a piece of parchment. This kind of hit is reminiscent of the subtle yet lethal deftness with which the faceless men kill. Then, consider the fact that for reasons never explained, every maester we meet throughout the story seems to have stockpiles of various poisons in their chambers. For instance, when Maester Crescent determined that Melisandre and her red god needed to go, he went to his chambers, and just think about how terrifying it would be to have a guy like this living in your house. His chambers seemed dim and gloomy after the brightness of the morning. With fumbling hands, the old man lit a candle and carried it to the workroom beneath the rookery stair, where his ointments, potions, and medicines stood neatly on their shelves. On the bottom shelf, behind a row of salves and squat clay jars, he found a vial of indigo glass, no larger than his little finger. It rattled when he shook it. Crescent blew away a layer of dust and carried it back to his table. Collapsing into his chair, he pulled the stopper and spilled out the vial's contents. A dozen crystals, no larger than seeds, rattled across the parchment he'd been reading. They shone like jewels in the candlelight, so purple that the maester found himself thinking that he had never truly seen the color before. The chain around his throat felt very heavy. He touched one of the crystals lightly with the tip of his little finger. Such a small thing to hold the power of life and death. It was made of a certain plant that grew only on the islands of the Jade Sea, half a world away. The leaves had to be aged and soaked in a wash of limes and sugar water, and certain rare spices from the Summer Isles. Afterwards, they could be discarded, but the potion must be thickened with ash and allowed to crystallize. The process was slow and difficult, the necessaries costly and hard to acquire. The alchemist of Lys knew the way of it, though, and the faceless men of Bravos, and the maesters of his order as well, though it was not something talked about beyond the walls of the citadel. All the world knew that a maester forged his silver link when he learned the art of healing, but the world preferred to forget that men who knew how to heal also knew how to kill. So, cleverly concealed amongst his healing potions and salves is a vial of rare and costly poison. Wonderful. Then he admits the maesters hide the fact that they are experts at making poison from the world. Even better. And what does he plan on doing with this poison no one in the castle knows he has? Nothing too sinister. He's only going to kill someone with it at the feast later that evening. Not to mention the fact that earlier in the prologue, he thinks to himself how he had the power to quote-unquote silence Patchface years ago, which creepily makes me think of Euron. Cresson isn't the only scholar with things like the Strangler laying around. After Tyrion arrests Pycelle, he took a look around his chambers, only to learn that he was in possession of every poison known to man which is likely how he quote-unquote finished John Aaron off, as the app states. What reasonable explanation could a Grand Maester offer as to why he has need of a stockpile of poison at court? Plus, the robes they wear allow them to hide all sorts of things in their sleeves, which means your Maester can, in the blink of an eye, go from being the kindly old man that tutors your children to a ruthless assassin with borderline faceless men efficiency. It gets even weirder when you think about the fact that they pretty much are no one, as they shed their names when joining the Order, making it very difficult to know who they really are or where they come from. Then, it takes a very serious turn towards being really creepy. When you think about the fact that these guys are the ones in charge of caring for you if you get sick. Now, there have been multiple examples in the story where someone that was doing something that the Faith didn't like 
ended up getting a quote-unquote bad belly. And when their maester came to save them, he was actually there to finish them off. With a little of whatever poison best suited the circumstances. And when one day these lords didn't wake up, no one was the wiser, because the one in charge of telling everyone what caused this lord's death was actually the guy who killed him. Then, let's think about the fact that these are the people who teach your children, and have complete control of communication. So, if you receive a raven that the maesters don't like, you might not ever see it. The best example of this was the raven that Maester Aemon sent to Stannis, to inform him that Lord Commander Mormont was attacked at the Fist of the First Men, and that the Night's Watch need every able-bodied man in the realm at the Wall as soon as possible, which Maester Pylos just tucked into a drawer with a pile of other letters that Stannis probably never saw. And if Davos didn't ask him for something new to read, Stannis probably never would have ever seen it. Now, if you're thinking that this is probably an isolated incident, and the Maesters as a whole don't tamper with communications, during the rebellions at the beginning of Aeneas's reign, a similarly suspicious chain of events followed a letter that Lord Harmon Dondarrion wrote to Aeneas, telling him that this vulture king is half mad, and his followers are a rabble, undisciplined and unwashed. We can smell them coming fifty leagues away. Then, the vulture king, who was west of Blackhaven and therefore had absolutely no way of intercepting a raven to King's Landing, stormed his castle. And did he kill him? No. Instead, he decided to cut the guy's nose off. You know, the nose that smelled him coming fifty leagues away? That seems entirely too poetic, and leads one to the obvious conclusion that his maester read the letter and passed its contents to his enemies, whose cause he supported. So, the unfortunate reality is, lords throughout the Seven Kingdoms pay the Citadel for the right to have an expert assassin brainwash their children, control all of their communications, and spy on them. So, Old Town was once again spared from a fiery end, and a new High Septon was chosen one who was 90 years old and seems likely to have been senile. But as such, he was very amenable to Magor's demands and agreed to dissolve the Faith Militant. Magor stayed in Old Town for a while afterwards, presiding over trials and holding court. He gave the captured warrior sons a simple choice, the wall or the sword. Most chose the wall. He pardoned Lord Hightower's brother and made amends with his sister, Cerise. Magor granted the remaining members of the Faith Militant until the end of that year to surrender their weapons and give up their rebellious ways. But when the year was up, any who defied him would have a bounty on their head. Some listened, many didn't. He placed a bounty of a golden dragon for the head of any unrepentant warrior son and a silver stag for the lice-ridden scalp of a poor fellow, which wasn't as effective as one might have thought, as the grip the faith had on the small folk was strong. The faith militant then took it upon themselves to elect their own high septon from amongst their leadership, in the form of Septon Moon, and under his and Joffrey Doggett's leadership, continued lurking in the wooded regions of Westeros, popping up all over the place and killing Targaryen loyalists and anyone they decided wasn't fanatical enough for them, whenever the opportunity arose. They were such a nuisance that Magor himself rode out to deal with them on a few occasions, capturing and executing Poxy Jane Poor on one such ranging, and returning to King's Landing with the heads of 2,000 poor fellows on another. Now... We don't really want to get into his nephew Aegon's rebellion that almost immediately followed Magor's victory over the High Septon and the Faith Militant, other than to say that according to Yandel, it was the coming together of Magor's family and the Faith that was Magor's undoing, which was the sentence that immediately preceded Aegon rebelling, so I think it's safe to assume that he was goaded into rebelling by the Faith. 
The only other alternative would be that he was just a real piece of shit opportunist who waited until after his uncle had saved their house from annihilation, which he never could have done, and decided that now that all the dirty work was done, he would like his crown now. Either way, it didn't go well for Aegon, as Quicksilver, his dragon, was about a quarter of the size of Balerion, and their fight went just about exactly how anyone with half a brain would expect. It was over pretty quickly. Magor then went back to concentrating on trying to produce an heir, and every time he got one of his wives pregnant, he took extra precautions and had a whole retinue of maesters, midwives, and septas care for his queens, which, shockingly, resulted in none of them making it to full term, giving birth to a series of creatures that are rumored to have looked a heck of a lot like what Tyrion was described looking like when he was born. So, Magor took three more wives of proven fertility, one of which was his niece Reyna, who his mother had suggested that he marry many years ago. That didn't work either, and in the end, it was his own family's joining with the very faith that Magor had saved them all from that drove the final nails into not only his coffin, but his legacy. By the time his nephew Jaehaerys announced his intent to depose him, Magor was a broken man. With his mother gone, he truly had no one. He had spent almost his entire adult life fighting, not because he was evil or because he was jealous and wanted his brother's throne. He did it because his family needed him. He did it because there was no one else who could, and his family's right to exist was at stake. And what did he get for all of his efforts? He was murdered on the very throne he fought for his family's right to sit, with his arms sliced open and a bent sword sticking through his neck. He had given everything for his family, and in the end, all he had was the abhorrence of pretty much everyone, including his own family, and was forever remembered in the histories the lying piece of shit maesters wrote as Magor the Cruel.